Welcome to Storytime with Reeve and McIntyre. Hello, everyone. Hey there. Read by the amazing Amy Sutton. Hello. Everybody was really cross with my dad after his brilliant thatching started a worldwide craze and all the thatch attracted giant space chickens. Luckily, I thought up a brilliant plan to lure the chickens away. But unluckily, our house was surrounded by an angry mob. When I got back downstairs, I could hear the angry mob coming down the street outside. Dad and Mr Slingsby had taken all the new furniture and piled it up in a barricade against the front door. The place looked just like it did in the old days. Bare, except for my drawings on the walls. It's going to be all right, I said. I have a plan. I talked to Lady Fru-Fru and she's going to help. But what help can she be? asked Mr Slingsby. There's an angry mob outside the front door. He held the letterbox open so we could hear their angry voices going rubab, 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 right outside. Suddenly, out in the backyard, Ponty began to bark. Oh no, said Dad. They must be climbing over the back fence, trying to get in that way. We all ran through into the kitchen and peered through the back door. Ponty stood outside his posh new kennel, barking and barking. But he wasn't barking at any intruders climbing over the fence. He was looking up into the sky. A wind came down on him, ruffling his fur and blasting all the kibble out of his bowl. A bright light shone down into the garden. We opened the door and stumbled out into the glare. The helicopter hung just outside my bedroom window, filling the night with the thump of its rotor blades. Lady Fru-Fru says, climb aboard, the pilot shouted, and a long rope ladder uncoiled from the helicopter's open doorway. Behind us, we could hear the mob beating at the front door. Dad pushed me forward. I clambered up the ladder into the helicopter. Mr Slingsby climbed after me, then Dad, with Ponty tucked under his arm. As we soared away, I looked down and saw the upturned faces of the angry mob watching us go. Where are you taking us? asked Mr Slingsby over the noise of the helicopter. To Lady Fru-Fru's private jet, the pilot shouted back. We flew past the city, past the huge raggedy nests where the huge raggedy chickens slept. At first I thought we were heading for the airport, But of course the airport was shut because of chickens nesting on the thatched terminal buildings. Instead, we went to a little airfield near the sea. Lady Fru-Fru's private jet was waiting for us there, as white and pointy as a paper dart. And quite soon we were roaring through the night towards Hollywood. And as we went, Dad and I worked out our daring plan. When we stepped off the jet on the runway at the bottom of Lady Fru-Fru's garden, she was waiting for us, dressed in a bright pink space suit and a very small bright pink silly hat that would just fit inside her space helmet. Her poor house, which Dad had thatched so beautifully, had been half flattened by the big fat chicken roosting on its roof. But Lady Fru-Fru didn't seem to mind too much. She gave me a huge hug, picking me up and whirling me around until I felt a bit sick. But I suppose that was good practice for going into space. When she put me down, Dad told her quickly what we were going to need. All the thatching materials you can find, he said, and we need them packed into your spaceship as soon as possible. I looked up at the spaceship, Fru Fru 1. It was strapped to its rocket boosters and standing on the Caterpillar Track platform thingy which was driving slowly towards a launch gantry at the very farthest corner of the airfield. 
It looked much bigger than space shuttles look on TV. That was good, because we were going to need a lot of thatching stuff on the moon. But it was also bad, because it was going to take ages to get it all packed. Don't you still have all those helpers? I asked. Most of them have gone home to be with their own families in this time of chickeny peril, said Lady Fru-Fru. I'm struggling here on my own with just two cooks, a chauffeur, three housemaids and five gardeners. Ask them if they'll help, said Dad. It still won't be very many, said Lady Fru-Fru. Then she had an idea. She took a phone out of her pink space handbag and quickly typed something. There, she said, pressing send, I sent a message to all my fans on the internet. We need your help right now. Hashtag thatch the moon. That should do it. I didn't see how, but I'd forgotten just how many fans Lady Fru-Fru has. Soon they began to arrive on bikes and skateboards or on foot. They clustered round Fru-Fru with wide eyes. They'd always dreamed of meeting her and talking to her, but till now the gates of her mansion had stayed firmly locked. What shall we do? they asked. How can we help? We need to get that rocket cram-packed full of thatch, said Fru-Fru. There was a barn full of spare thatching reed in Fru-Fru's garden. It turned out she'd been planning to ask Dad back anyway to thatch a new summer house she was having built. When all that was jammed into the hold of Fru-Fru-1, the fans started sneaking up to the house and pulling armfuls of thatch out from under the giant space chicken. The chicken clucked softly in its sleep and flapped a wing, but it didn't seem to realise that its nest was being stolen from under it, and we didn't take enough to wake it. By the time the sun started to rise, that spaceship was just about as full of thatch as a spaceship can be. We still need more, said Lady Fru-Fru. The moon is a biggish sort of thing. We're going to need everyone in the world to start sending reeds, straw, anything that we can make thatch from. The good stuff too, not just odds and ends. This has got to be the best thatch ever. So tell everyone, get our Thatch the Moon hashtag trending. Oh, Fru-Fru, sighed the fans. How did you get such a wonderful idea? Oh, you know, said Lady Fru-Fru with a modest shrug. I realised that if my plan worked, nobody would ever know that it was my plan. Lady Fru-Fru just had this way of taking all the credit for herself. But I didn't mind too much, as long as we got rid of those chickens. Fru-Fru took a few selfies with the fans and then ran to the waiting spaceship. Dad went too, of course, and so did I, and so did Mr Slingsby. I think he was still afraid that the angry mob might catch us up and thought he might be safer in outer space. And we took Ponty with us, because it didn't seem fair to leave him behind. Luckily, Lady Fru-Fru had a set of spacesuits which she'd made for her concert in space that never happened, and there was one designed for a dog which just about fitted Ponty. There was one which just about fitted me too, and even one for Mr Slingsby, although it didn't really suit him. We zipped ourselves into them, put our helmets on, waved to Lady Fru-Fru's fans, and climbed the ladder to the Fru-Fru one. A few moments later, chickens all over the Hollywood Hills had a rude awakening as Fru-Fru One's engines let out a great fart of flames and sent it soaring into the clouds on a tower of smoke. It takes about three days to get to the moon, and it's a pretty boring three days mostly, especially if your phone doesn't get a signal or you've forgotten to bring the charger with you. And my phone didn't get a signal, and I'd forgotten to bring the charger, so I couldn't even play games on it. We landed at a place called the Sea of Tranquility. It isn't really a sea. There isn't much of a beach or anything. And to be honest, I think it's a bit overrated. And I say we landed, but we more sort of crashed. 
The Fru Fru 1 hadn't been designed to land on the moon. It sort of flumped down on its tummy and surfed for a long way across the moon dust. How do we take off again? I asked when we'd finally come to a stop. We don't, said Lady Fru Fru. We haven't got any fuel left anyway. We burned it all up getting here. Are you telling me we're trapped on the moon? yelled Mr Slingsby. Nobody said anything about us getting trapped on the moon. Relax, said Dad. Someone will come and rescue us. When they hear about our plan, other spaceships will be sent to help and we'll catch a lift home in one of those. I hoped he was right. Lady Fru-Fru was the first to step outside. It was her spaceship after all. This is one small step for a woman, she said, but a giant leap for pop stars and thatching and stuff. Then she floated gracefully down onto the lunar surface and landed in a little puff of moon dust. We all followed her and bounced about for a while, getting used to the gravity, which is only one-eighth of the gravity of Earth. On the moon, we all weighed about as much as balloons or maybe quite small cushions. It was fun. It was like being on a slow-motion trampoline. But we weren't there to have fun. Dad opened the ship's big cargo bay doors and said, Let's get thatching. Then he got to work, while the rest of us started unloading armfuls of reed. It was hard work without Lady Fru-Fru's fans to help us, but only one-eighth as hard as it would have been on Earth. Near the place where we had landed, there was a big crater with steep, jagged sides. Dad decided that we should thatch that. So we dragged the stuff over there and set to work. A thatched crater will make a lovely nest, he explained. I helped, bouncing and bounding my way up to the rock pile to deliver fresh bundles of reeds or straw to Dad so that he could peg them in place. We thatched and thatched and thatched until that crater was one giant cosy bowl of straw but there was still no message from anyone on Earth and no sign of any other spaceships coming to help us. Someone will have got our messages, said Lady Fru-Fru. My fans will spread the word. But what if they didn't, I wondered. What if everyone was too busy worrying about the giant space chickens to listen? People will look up and see what we're doing, said Dad. They'll understand our plan and they'll come to help. But what if they didn't notice, I thought. We'd worked long and hard at thatching that crater and it was as big as any of the buildings Dad had thatched on Earth before the chickens came. But when I stood on the high rim of it and looked around me at the wasteland stretching away in all directions, I realised that it was only one tiny speck on the wide, white face of the moon. What if nobody saw it? Dad was too busy working to worry about things like that. He plaited the thatch together on the top of the topmost rock of the crater rim. He twisted it into the shape of a happy chicken and stood back to admire his handiwork. There, he said, that's a good start. What now? asked Lady Fru-Fru. We carry on thatching, said Dad. We can't, said Mr Slingsby. And he was right. We had used up all the supplies we had brought from Earth. The cargo hold of Fru-Fru-1 was empty. There was not a reed or a straw or a willow peg left. We stood by the empty spaceship and looked at the golden crater we had thatched and all the craters and mountains in the distance, moon grey and moon white. And I knew that we had failed. It's not enough, said Lady Fru-Fru. And that was when a brilliant thing happened. The radio in the cabin of the Fru-Fru-1, which had been silent ever since we blasted off, suddenly crisped and crackled into life. Ground control to Lady Fru-Fru, it said. Can you hear me, Lady Fru-Fru? 
we all ran into the cabin. Frou-Frou here, said Lady Frou-Frou. We saw your selfie, said the radio voice. We heard about your plan. Your fans have been spreading the word all over the internet. Thatch the moon? It's a brilliant idea. Why, thank you, said Lady Frou-Frou. And then she looked at me. And then she said, actually, it wasn't my idea. It's Lily's. She's Bill Hatcher's daughter, and she's the one who said we should thatch the moon. It was just about the proudest moment of my life. Neat idea, kid, said the radio voice. Everyone on Earth has been pestering their governments about it, and they're sending help. They should be with you any minute. I bounced out of the ship down onto the moon dust, up in the black sky above the jagged horizon of the moon. Something caught the sunlight, and then another something, and another, like little flakes of silver falling. And suddenly I saw that each of those silver flakes was a ship gliding down toward 